Uh, otherwise, science, I have to uh, switch to English. Um, I have two bold people who try to translate my German English into Polish. Um, good job. I hope uh, you will succeed. Um, <coughs> yeah, uh, a few words before I start with uh, my talk. Um, Jarek uh, came to my lab um, as a young student and uh, he was um, immediately, um, well, in the group. He's a very talented uh, person and you can't imagine how proud I am that uh, he went back to Poland and didn't stay in, in Germany and tried to get a job there. He went back to Poland went to Gdansk, went to Warsaw and came back to Poznan as a professor. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's really um, a thing I'm very proud of that, that he did that, uh, bringing, um, uh, coming back as a young scientist and trying to educate other people to become scientists and try to um, yeah, bring psychotherapy on a science-based um, way to the patient, uh, because that's our mission. And um, some of this mission I want to share with you today, and I was told that the audience is rather diverse, so I will try to be not too simple, but also not too complex. So, um, in case you have questions, you can raise your hands, you can ask in Polish, and I don't know how we get it then into English, um, but um, I can stop at every moment. Okay. What I want to talk about today is um, about something everybody knows, um, an emotion. But if you try to define that, you get into trouble. Um, William James once said, he's one of our psychologists who should have become a writer because he could excellently write. And um, he once said, Everybody knows what an emotion is until he's asked to define. So this is one task we psychologists, of course, do. We try to define the phenomena we are talking about. So we talk about the central emotional state. And this central emotional state is elicited. An emotion is always elicited. And the interesting thing about uh, the elicitation is that it can be elicited by real things real events, but also by thoughts. We can lay in our bed and think about the past or the future and suddenly we have emotions. We can think us into panic. And emotions can be evoked, elicited by persons, people from our own species, but also by other species as well, and even objects uh, which do not live at all. Uh, can evoke emotions, and I will talk about that. And the central state, we can't see that. We have to infer this central state. And we infer it by looking at the event and by looking at the response. And the emotional response is a multifaceted event. Um, and I will talk about some of these response elements. One important one is the emotional expression. The emotional expression tells us what people feel. And our face is like an open book. And the first task you have is to give me an estimation of the emotions you see. These are pictures from a German, Irenaeus Eibel Eibelsfeld, he was a biologist, he went to Papua New Guinea and photographed um, the local Indians there. And what would you say, what is the emotional expression here? Happy. Let's see. Your child died. Yes, this guy is sad. So what uh, this biologist did, he gave these scripts to the people and told them to imagine this event. And what you see is the emotion in the expression, elicited by the imagination, by the mental process. What is this? This is a little bit difficult. 
Angry, that's good. Look at that. You are very angry and would like to hit the other person into the face or just hit it. What is this? This is also not that easy. Exactly. It's disgust. Um, so what does it say? It says, um, you see a dead pig that has been there for a long time and decays. Yeah, I, I saw a disgust response even to this sentence. You see it when the nose is lifting up a little bit. Um, the sense of this lifting up of the nose is that the smell doesn't get into your brain. Uh, and therefore you automatically close the channels of your nose. Um, it's a good thing to do. But if we talk about expressions and try to read emotions in the face, we have to be cautious. Because emotional memory and emotional uh, expressions, excuse me, can be fake news. And I tell you why. We have a brain that is very plastic and our brain can produce emotional expressions. But I give you a little, well, a little trick how you can, um, well, decipher the voluntary emotions from the real emotions. Because the voluntary emotions come from your cortex, from your um, cortical brain areas, from the gray matter here. And um, if you want to voluntarily um, make a movement, you always start in the left cortical area. And the left cortical area crosses to the other side of the muscle. So when you have an involuntary smile, we call that a Duchenne smile, that's something like this. It's cute. So if you see the right face moving and the left face doesn't move, this is no real emotion. Watch out if people do that. An, inv an involuntary emotional expression comes from deeper in the brain. And we will talk about that uh, later. If we talk about the organization of emotions like fear and anxiety, these emotional expressions come from the basal ganglia. They are in the lower areas of the brain, below the cortex. So, um, and these emotions are much more symmetric. So we have a more symmetric face. Uh, your emotional expression is the same on the left and on the right side. So whenever somebody smiles at you, look at the left side. If the left, left side smiles with it and the eyes wrinkle with it, particularly the left one, this guy is really happy, or this lady. This is a typical fear face. Um, a fear face you can see by um, muscle tension, uh, in the uh, frontal muscle, uh, opening of the eyes and opening of the mouth. So um, I could go on with emotional expression for an hour, but uh, we don't have time for that. So I have to move on. Um, we have the expression here and we have an indicator, like the face, for example. We have other indicators like gestures, like the voice, um, as forms of emotional expressions. Um, for example, E is a typical voice you probably also know in Poland because it's not um, very language specific, which is related to a speci uh, specific emotion. Uh, like, ooh, surprise, um, is also um, a, a vocal sound that is related to special emotional expressions. Uh, what we also do as humans, we talk about our emotions. Um, and we feel emotions. This is a conscious process. And this is very complicated because um, you have to construct your feeling. It's, it's not immediately there. If I would ask you, how do you feel? You have to think. And then you have to find words for it. And uh, so if you ask somebody, how do you feel? You sometimes get answers like this. How should I feel? What do I know? I don't know how I feel. You always want to know how I feel. You are angry. I'm not angry. I'm sad. 
So uh, what what you see here is a discrepancy what you often see in the emotional expression and the emotional words. And particularly if you work with patients, you have to be careful not to take one channel as a real channel and the other channel as a fake channel. So you have to, be, to take all channels serious. All channels mean something. Um, we have many words for emotions. Uh, we have over 500 words to describe our emotions. Um, uh, and this is based on, on Latin words. Um, there are some languages that have more, emotion, um, more words for emotions, but um, in the old languages we find about 500 words for emotions. And here you have our um, favorites for today. We talk about panic, about fear, and yeah, where's anxiety? Anxiety is something here, afraid and worried. Those are the words that are used most often in this area. Um, and what is now the difference between fear and anxiety? What do we psychologists say what's the difference? Um, fear is something that is elicited by a threatening event. So we first define the situation. Um, and a threatening event can come from the outside. And it could be something like a pit bull terrier that is racing towards us. This is what we call predator defense. We have some animal that attacks us. That can be an alligator, that can be a snake, that can be a pit bull terrier or a, a spider. And uh, these defensive responses we see is a response we call fear. And I will talk more about that later. We have also threats that do not come from outside the world, but that come from inside our body. Those are threats that are also very, very fear evoking. For example, if you uh, suddenly do not get any air anymore, actually that is used um, in, in, in some interrogation techniques. Uh, the waterboarding technique is exactly working with this internal threat. And somebody who has experienced that, uh, what air hunger means, that you almost suffocate. It's, it's a very, very potent threat. And it's really um, eliciting a feeling, a feeling of, of strong fear. You are close to die. And... Uh, what we also see in fear is that the intensity of the, of the response, the feeling and the expression increases with the intensity of, uh, with the increasing intensity and with the increasing proximity of the threatening stimulus. So if the, if the predator comes closer, the fear is increasing. At the peak of the fear, which we often name panic, and I will show you an example when we talk about internal threats. Uh, we take flight, if we can get away, or fall into a play dead reflex. We just fall to the floor. For example, um, if we are sitting in a dental chair and uh, we, we get a dental treatment and we can't get away, sometimes we faint. That's, that's like a reflex that we play dead. Um, interesting is uh, the fear immediately goes away when the th threat is gone. When the pit bull is gone, the fear is away. There's a little afterflow, but then it's gone. And this is a complete difference to another emotion which is much more painful, uh, which we call anxiety. Because anxiety is something that is much more complex because we need a memory for that. We can only be anxious of something um, where we um, expect a potential threat. Anxiety means we expect a potential threat that has not been happened before. We have never been exposed to that, but we expect it in the future. And this is a completely different sort of emotion 
which is clinically highly relevant. This means that a person can become anxious just for hearsay. When you read in a newspaper that something badly happened at a certain spot in your town and you go to the spot, you feel this anxiety, although nothing has happened to you at all. It's just hearsay that there might be something dangerous there. Or you read it in the newspaper that things are getting bad and then in certain areas and then you never go to these areas and I will show you uh, examples for that. What uh, happens during anxiety is that we show a different emotional response. We are hypervigilant to everything that could be a potential threat and we tense up and uh, the slightest expected sensory event let us startle and I will show you an example for that too. Uh, one last thing I want to show you um, is the third domain which um, makes people sometimes suffer from their emotions because um, there's another component in our emotions, um, the blood, sweat and tears component, uh, which means that emotions like fear and anxiety are basically constructed in our body and in our brain to prepare us for actions. We wouldn't need any emotions if we wouldn't prepare us for actions. Let me give you an example. If a car is facing towards you and you wouldn't have any fear, you would stand there and the car would come, go over you. And that's history then. You would be history. You wouldn't pass your genes to the next generation. However, when a car is approaching you and you think, oh my goodness, and then you jump away um, because when the car is approaching you, the heart is already bouncing and the blood is moving towards your muscles and then you can jump away. And so the fear protects you for the dangerous event. And therefore we need this strong emotional uh, physiolog physiological changes. And um, we have another um, repertoire in our behavior. Uh, sometimes we av avoid threats in advance. Uh, and I will come to, back to that uh, too later. These physiological dispositions are routed in very old circuits in our mammalian brain. Uh, mammalian brain. And um, this is, of course, a good thing because these old circuits are very fast, so we can respond very fast. On the other hand, they are very hard to control. And therefore, fear can sometimes be painful so it, it, or embarrassing that um, if we show a fear response, and which we do not want to show, we can't really control it. And that's uh, due to the fact that very old brain structures are taking over in the brain. And I will show you some examples of that too. So if we put all things together, we have a definition of fear and anxiety, which is a central emotional state that is um, expressed in an emotional response comprising expression, physiological changes and reports of feelings. And we also have heard that the nature of the emotion changes with increasing proximity of the threat. If the threat is far away, if we are not sure whether the threat will arrive, whether we have some, some thoughts about potential threats, we call this state anxiety. And I told you that this state is basically characterized by a hypervigilant brain that pays attention to everything in the environment. And I will show you that this is basically a, a brain a task that is done in the prefrontal cortex and in the sensory systems. As soon as the threat is detected, we go into a fear state. And the fear state is characterized by an attentive freezing response. We wait, look and see. 
and um, the activation of the brain moves away from the frontal cortex to the limbic structures, more into the middle of the brain. Um, and here we have all the structures that organize the automatic response uh, components, but the organism still stays in contact with the environment. That changes during proximal threat. During proximal threat, the brain goes on automatic mode, just organizing simple behavior like flight, fight, or um, even faint. And this is basically done by the brain stem. And in this state, you can't talk to people because they can't listen. They, the the and attentional systems are not open anymore because you're just a brainstem animal. And if somebody is in panic and you say, just relax, he doesn't listen. You, you can't talk somebody out of a panic. You have to hold him like, like a child who is, has a bad temper. You have to hold it tight. You can't talk to those extreme emotions. Um, you need to do other techniques to calm them down. Okay. Um, I would like to show you one example from our lab, some science. Um, I was allowed to give you some scientific data. I know I shouldn't overwhelm you with them, but some you should see. Because this is work that was done by uh, famous pro Professor Michalowski. And uh, I show you uh, how he was at work. Um, uh, he was uh, here um, applying a big sensor net with uh, 256 electrodes and uh, was amplifying them and uh, analyzing them and uh, subjects were sitting here and um, looking at pictures and um, this is the um, unit that um, well controlled the entire experiment and what did Jarek do uh, wasn't an, was an excellent experiment um, he measured the so-called P1 component of the evoked potentials. Um, what is this? Um, what you do is you present people with pictures. And what the brain does, it gives you a response to the picture. You need a couple of steps to extract the response from the raw EEG because um, the potential has very small amplitude in microvolts and you have to average some responses and then you see a wave. A wave which gives you information which part of the brain is activated and shows a response. And this is what Jarek found. He had two groups. One people, one group were terribly afraid of spiders. We call them spider phobics. They really didn't like spiders. They didn't want to touch them and didn't want to see them. They really were afraid of spiders. And there was another group. We called them controls. They were healthy. We don't know whether they were all healthy, but they didn't fear spiders. They didn't care about spiders. And what Jarek did, they brought them all into the laboratory and showed them pictures. In the first stage, they showed them neutral pictures. What were neutral pictures? There were pictures of books, wicker baskets, um, pencils, nothing very interesting. What the brain does, if you take a look here, it gives you a response after 100 milliseconds. And this response is in the back of the head. And in the back of the head is our visual cortex, the part of the brain that encodes the entire visual information that comes into the brain. And after 100 milliseconds, we know what we see, because those were simple pictures. The second um, finding here is that you don't see a different difference between phobics and controls. Of course, both groups have the same visual cortex, they see identical. Uh, when you show them the identical pictures. They are not blind, so they show the same sort of response. Then we showed them unpleasant pictures. Those were pictures um, with nasty stuff on it, with um, 
well, mutilations and, and disgusting pictures and so forth. Again, we saw a strong response, which was a little bit stronger than for the neutral ones, because these pictures were amplified, because they are significant. But again, no difference between phobics and controls. And now something happened. Professor Jarek came into the room again, and he said, well, if you want to stay in this chair, we have another task for you. Do you want to stay in this chair? And most of the people say, yes. Well, during the next minutes, half an hour or so, there might be spiders among the pictures. Uh, do you really want to stay in the chair? Yeah, most of the people said, well, okay, I'm afraid of spiders, but maybe a picture I can see now at that. Now let's see what happens to the brain. This was very interesting. We showed again this neutral pictures um, again for, and here is a spider pictures. Spider phobics showed a stronger response to the, fiber, the spider picture, but this was not the most interesting effect. This is the most interesting effect because what happened after people knew they will there might be spider pictures. To get you back to the anxiety definition, now there is a potential threat. There could be a spider picture in the stream. Um, you expected something happen. And now I show you the response to the neutral pictures. These are the neutral pictures. They are hard to see. Maybe I show you the unpleasant. They are better to see. Um, now, what you see, these are not spider pictures. Those are unpleasant pictures. Those are neutral pictures. And what you see, the P1 after 100 milliseconds in the phobia group is twice as high as in the control group for neutral pictures and unpleasant pictures. What does this mean? This means if you expect a potential threat, a spider picture, you are hyper vigilant to everything. What does it mean? For somebody who has a spider phobia, if somebody with a spider phobia knows I go into the basement and two weeks ago there was a spider in the basement and uh, this person work, walks down uh, the stairs and then sees a black spot which nobody else sees because the brain is tuned up, the visual system is tuned up to every potential sign of a spider. And this makes this person hypervigilant. And as soon as a spider is spotted, the fear response sets in. But the hypervigilance makes the entire context extremely anxious. Or ex she's extremely afraid of the entire um, context where a potential threat might occur. And this is clinically very important because people avoid these situations. They don't go in the basement anymore. They rather go to a supermarket, buy new potatoes, instead of going into the basement and getting the potatoes. And this is, of course, we, when we talk about other anxieties, uh, much more complicated. Okay. Um, what do we see in the body? Um, I show you uh, what the body does. If you present these uh, spiders, normally, uh, I don't know whether you have uh, any experience of a um, late of a slideshow lately when you saw pictures of your friends from holidays, normally you fall asleep um, because um, your body is really bored to death. Um, if you show people pictures of spiders when they are afraid of spiders, they show a dramatic heart rate acceleration. They sit in the chair, watch a picture, and the heart goes up by seven beats per minute. This this something. I mean, this is not trivial. And this happens within three seconds. And uh, then the body is activated. And um, if we do another thing, if we um, startle them, give them <coughs> startling sound while they watch a slide, they jump out of the chair. We don't measure how high they jump. We measure the uh, orbicularis oculi muscle, which is the short switch in the eye. And uh, this is a brainstem reflex. And the brainstem reflex is 
already potentiated uh, when you are in this uh, situation. Interestingly, uh, when you see pleasant slides, um, you don't startle, you don't show this blink response that strongly. Um, perhaps another side story on this, um, we also uh, asked uh, people to um, watch the slides as long as they wanted. And what you see is um, people looked longer period of time at the pleasant slides, but they also looked a longer period of time to the unpleasant slides compared to the neutral. We all know that if there's a traffic accident, people on the other side of the road slow down because they are interested, even in the bad things. We are interested in the bad things, although we don't like them very much, but we like unpleasant things things better than being bored by neutral stuff. Nothing happens at all. So uh, that's the reason why people are also interested in unpleasant things. We see that the attentional system is really um, blind for valence. Uh, the attention is always big if something is arousing. So um, let's have a final look at the brain. Um, what I told you is that um, at the beginning of the um, threat, when the threat is still distance, we have basically prefrontal areas and limbic areas um, that are uh, involved in the encoding of the, uh, of the environment. And uh, if the, when the threat is more proximal, we have a communication between the limbic area and um, the brainstem that then sets um, the motor programs and the physiological programs. Um, and we know pretty much how this works. Um, we know the crosstalk between the prefrontal cortex and the structure, the limbic area we call amygdala. And uh, there's a lateral nucleus that communicates with the prefrontal brain and communicates with the central nucleus that then connects to the, um, to the periaqueductal gray that then organizes the behavioral adjustments. Just a short um, experiment to show you that it really uh, happens in humans as well, because as you might know, we have now the technology to uh, look at the living brain um, and um, seeing what the brain does uh, when we evoke certain emotions. And what we did in this experiment, I want to show you um, shortly uh, what we did, just um, concentrate to this column here. They were um, uh, circle. They were uh, um, rectangles, either yellow or blue. And if the rectangle was blue, um, you knew that you couldn't do anything. Uh, you got a painful stimulus in 50% of the cases, and the proximity was um, was signaled by the size of the cue that increased with increasing proximity, and the person had the um, impression that the dot is coming towards him. And uh, we had a different condition where um, nothing happened. And let me show you what the brain does. Um, let's skip about the physiological data. I will just show you what we saw in the brain. If we look at the activation and compare the stage one, when the threat is signaled but is still proximal, the, the pain stimulus is not at all there, we have a stronger activation in the prefrontal area and in the limbic areas. Exactly what I told you. So we are evaluating the situation. What is, what is going on here? And now the threat is, the, the circle is getting bigger and bigger. And now we're at stage five. The painful stimulus is just to come and you can't do nothing about it. And what we see now is a switch from this prefrontal limbic activation to the brainstem activation. We see a strong activation of the brainstem. Now you can't control anything anymore. If, the, if, if, you have a, if you're sitting in the dentist chair and you know this drill is just hitting a nerve and you sense it, you might well slap the dentist. Uh, and then uh, afterwards you say, oh, sorry, I didn't want to do that. But uh, you just were, you were overwhelmed by the emotion. And 
next time you say, oh, that was my brainstem, sorry. Um, uh, I can't do anything about it. But that's what, what uh, patients report. The next question, let me see where we are. I have a little bit of time left. Um, when do we say, this is all normal, normal emotions I'm talking about. So when do these emotions get out of control? When do we speak of anxiety disorders? That's a critical question. When do we have too much anxiety? And um, we have a coding system there, um, which uh, we call DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Diseases. And this is our Bible for defining psychopathology. And um, the Bible says, uh, in this case, anxiety disorders share features of excessive and persistent fear to perceived in imminent threat or anxiety anticipation of future threat. Exactly what I just told you. Anxiety, anticipation of future threat that hasn't happened yet, fear, perceived imminent threat. Both states can overlap, okay, agreed and uh, related behavioral disturbances. What this sentence says, all anxiety disorders are the same psychologically. They might have different shapes, they might have different elicitors, but in principle, they are all the same. This is important if we think about therapy, about treating anxiety disorders. We should treat them all in the same way. Just tailor a little bit what we do during the therapy but in principle, it's the same sort of intervention. Okay. What makes anxiety disorders different from normal anxiety? It's anxiety by being excessive and persistent. Hmm. Excessive and persistent. Uh, the DSM, DSM says persistence, okay, typically lasting six months or more with some degrees of flexibility. Hmm. Yeah, now you, as a clinician, you are, well, a little bit in the fog, but um, at least you have some, some sort of guidelines. Excessive is even more complicated. We don't have a good idea what excessive fear is. So the DSM says, determination whether fear or anxiety is excessive is made by the clinician. So the clin clinician has to judge whether this fear is excessive or not. And importantly, to do this sort of clinical judgment, you have to take cultural, contextual factors into account. Because we have very different cultural um, sort of rules, what we define as being excessive. If you go into a jungle, an Indian tribe, and uh, would talk somebody, well, if, 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 if somebody is afraid of, of um, spiders, they wouldn't believe you that this would exist because they eat these animals. They don't even, uh, they can't even imagine that, that some people run away from spiders. They, they grill them um, and, and they, um, uh, they, 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 I don't know how, how do you, say it in English, um, but, but they get the liquids out of the, the legs and all these things. Uh, interesting, we do that with crabs um, and have no problems with that, by the way. And if we talk about Japanese fears, it's different than um, European fears and, and so forth. So to, to judge that something is excessive is very complicated and we don't have a metric. We, we don't have a sort of a laboratory value that we say, now you have um, amplitude of, let's say, 1.0 microvolt, now you are ill. This is not possible in mental disorders. And it will never be, I can tell you. So you need the cultural judgment in any event. And then there is another thing that is important, uh, that is said in this, um, in this uh, DSM-5. Um, we, we do this judgment whether the fear is excessive and we do this judgment based on two things. The degree of functional impairment, which means 
um, the normal social, occupational, um, behavioral functions do not work anymore. This person does not function very well anymore. And the second uh, criterion is subjective distress. Um, this is not that easy either because some people talk a lot about their distress and some people never talk about their distress. And uh, we need to find a little better sort of criteria to define mental illness, but this is where we are. We have tried many others um, and this is um, the classification we rely on in the, at the moment. Um, we know that um, in, in principle subjective uh, distress can be um, related to reported symptoms, so we have some diagnostic criteria uh, with regard to reported symptoms, and that functional impairment is often uh, related to safety and avoidance behavior. And based on these um, categories, criteria, we classify anxiety disorders into three big groups. Uh, the first group is basically a group where we have fear, excessive fear, uh, and if they are exaggerated and cause subjective distress and functional impairment, we call them phobias. And then we further classify them by the objects uh, that are feared. And the second group is uh, basically a group uh, where we have um, panic attacks coming out of the blue, we do not find any real reasons for it. Uh, so we have some internal threats that people um, somehow sense. And uh, then we have a combination of fear and anxiety, uh, which is uh, related to the worry about future attacks and their consequences. And if both of these um, elements fall together, uh, then we have the diagnosis of panic disorder. And the third group um, is basically uh, when people worry about everything. Uh, and this is uh, called the so-called uh, generalized anxiety disorder. People are worrying about their financial situation, about their um, partnership, about the future, about everything. And um, this is called generalized anxiety disorder often combined with, dis uh, with depression. Okay, how many phobias exist? i show you some. Um, here's a list, a short list, of over 144 phobias. And I name a few you might know. Arachnophobia is fear of spiders. Synophobia, fear of dogs. And I give you my favorite phobia which is Paraskeva decatria phobia. Does anybody know what this is? Well, now you will know. It's fear of Friday the 13th. What you see from this list, um, it's, it's good for the media. Whenever there is a Friday the 13th, I get phone calls from the media. Well, Dr. Ham, you're a phobia expert. How many patients do you have? Uh, with Friday the third, with fear of Friday the thirteenth, and some uh, younger um, broadcasting uh, systems um, give me the task: Can you say Paraskeva decatria phobia again? And I say that and say, Wow, this is just great, Doctor Ham. And um, this this is good for the media, but it does not help us anything because um, it's not it's it's just using a Greek and a Latin word and put it in front of phobia. It doesn't give us any scientific information, it doesn't give us any clinical uh, information, it's just funny. But we don't want to make fun of our patients. So we have to uh, think about a better way to think about phobias, uh, to think about these specific fears. And um, therefore we take three big uh, or four big groups now uh, where we um, define uh, subtypes of phobia. We have a subtype we call animal type and those phobias are basically related to the predator defense and we do not dislike all animals. We almost have no 
uh, phobia of um, rabbits, very rare. Uh, we have no um, phobia of um, what's a cute animal, um, guinea pigs, very rare, but we have phobia of rats. Why is that? Rats are strange, they look like guinea pigs, but we rarely have fear of guinea pigs. We don't have a guinea pig phobia. But we have fe uh, fear phobias of spiders, rarely flies. Sometimes cockroaches, but mostly spiders. Uh, this is interesting, and um, uh, it's, I, I show you why this is so. The second is fear of blood injection and injury type. Some people can't see blood, they can't tolerate needles, they don't like dentists um, or dental treatment. They might like the, dental, the dentist, but not the dental treatment. Um, and then we have the situational type. Uh, which means uh, fear of entrapment. Those people do not like to go through tunnels, take elevators, airplanes, and so forth. And then we have a uh, natural environment type uh, that's basically fear of heights, uh, fear of thunderstorms, and water, deep waters. These um, phobias have different symptoms. Uh, they are, these are very uh, strong, sympathetic-driven responses. These are vaguely-driven responses. These are uh, different forms of, of fear responses. I don't want to go into this. But let me tell you something about the reason why these things develop. There are three ways how you can um, acquire these sort of anxiety disorders. The first... Um, reason is you make a direct negative experience. This is from an experiment from 1920. It's called the Experiments of Little Albert. And uh, it was done by John Watson. And what did John Watson do? This is Little Albert. He played with a nice little rat. It was a white rat. And he liked the rat. And here's Dr. Watson. And what he did, he associated this Red, and is playing with the red, with an aversive event. And as a result of this learning experience, uh, little Albert got afraid of this um, animal. Um, I, show, uh, I, I will mention another um, a story um, which happened to my son. He allowed me to tell me that. Um, when he was about learning to run, to walk. Uh, he was uh, about 13 months old. And uh, our neighbor just bought a new dog, a very small little puppy, very sweet. Um, and it happened that my son was getting out of the door from our house and the dog was getting out, out of the door from the neighbor. And they both met in the middle and the dog ran over my son and stood on his breast. He never remembered this experience. I remembered it because I observed it, but his part of the brain that is re responsible for these memory processes, the hippocampus, was not developed at that time. But nevertheless, this memory shaped his behavior because many years later, when he was 15, and uh, we made him um, bring newspapers into the neighborhood and get some money out of that. He was still very reluctant to go to neighbors with dogs. He didn't know why. He just said, I don't like dogs and I don't like people with dogs and I need to stay away from that. So he had this very early experience and these experiences are often very early. They're not always remembered. Some about 80% remember them well but 20% don't remember them very well, but they can shape behavior. The second way how you acquire this is by observing relevant models. Also in your early childhood. Um, this is, for example, an experiment by Suze Meinecke, a very interesting experiment, because she looked at monkeys. And what she did is she did a banana, put it on a glass board, and below the glass board was a snake. And if you have a hungry monkey, they immediately grab the banana and eat it. 
whether there is a snake or not. But then, um, these little monkeys that were reared in the laboratory saw a video of their mothers showing extreme anxiety response, and they really had it because they were uh, from the wilderness, uh, to snakes. And after the young monkeys saw this video, they never took a banana anymore. They never reached across the snake in their life. So, if you have a model that tells you don't do that, this is very dangerous, you keep that in mind. And the last example, learning by instruction, the influence of media. And uh, this is the reason why we do not like spiders. This is Aragog. We play with these sort of bad animals, like spiders and snakes. This is Harry Potter 2. Um, this is arachnophobia, uh, and, um, snake phobia. How is it called? Reptile phobia. And this is another interesting example. Um, when 9-11, um, the two airplanes crashed into the um, Twin Towers. Um, what happened afterwards, uh, we had um, passenger um, demand de uh, degreed or dropped by 30%. So we had a drop in passengers by 30% just reading a newspaper article. And um, it took about three years until the numbers recovered. You see that if you hear something from the media, this all shapes your anxiety and that shapes your behavior. And the final thing I wanted to tell you, these are data from the so-called Dunedin study. Dunedin is a little town in, in New Zealand, a marvelous town. Um, they did a longitudinal study that um, went on for 24 years. And they were looking at the development of fears and uh, they asked an interesting question. Uh, who develops fear of heights and fear of deep waters? And what they found is those kids who have fallen multiple times from a climbing frame do not develop height phobia. Those with, with very bad experience with heights, they don't develop height phobia when they were adults. Rather, adults with height phobia never climbed any tree. So they never challenged their childhood fears. So we have a fourth way uh, that is important, uh, which we call um, incubation of fear. You have to to fight the childhood fears, to overcome these phobias, not to carry them into the adulthood. Lack of coping with childhood fears is another important mechanism in the etiology of anxiety disorders, particularly for water, heights, and darkness. For example, as an adult, if you are afraid of waters, you will not be able to swim. It's, it's, it's sad to see what people do when they try to learn to swim when they are 55 and they, they are so afraid of water, it's, it's so difficult. And then you have these young kids with five, three, they, they jump into deep water without any problem and then they start to swim. Um, so I don't know whether you have ever tried to train somebody with 55 years to swim. It's, it's very hard if you never overcame your early childhood fears. These findings have important implications for the mechanisms in treating anxiety disorders. And let me, um, in, prin in principle, um, give you some final statements how to treat anxiety disorders. And um, the main thing to overcome anxiety is in principle shown in the Dunedin study. Getting the patient into the feared situation is crucial for successful treatment of anxiety disorders. And it's an important man who said that, it's not myself. If we do not succeed to get the patient into the feared set situation, then the treatment does not work. And this statement comes from the inventor of psychotherapy, uh, the Austrian uh, Sigmund Freud. This is in German what he said. So he is the one who really 
framed, coined this principle in anxiety disorder treatment. Sometimes it somehow it got lost in, in the mid in the last 100 years. But this is really what he said. You have to bring patients into the situation. And another very famous German, um, Goethe, uh, who was afraid of heights, um, he described how he fought his fear of heights by going up uh, on the highest places of the churches to be able to go to Rome and um, have this incredible views from the churches to the market squares. But he couldn't do it at the very beginning. He had to train and to train and he always went to Strasbourg and trained there and whenever you were in Strasbourg, you, if you get up the monster there, the dome, it's, it's challenging. Try it. So what do we have to do? We have to do a systematic exposure to the feared situation without escaping from it. So here's a little example for how we treat spider fear people. We put the spider into a box and then we sit the patient in a distance and then we get the threat more and more proximal um, until at the very end the patient is able to touch the spider or put it on the shoulder or in the hair. Um, this can be done within two hours and this uh, patient is surprised how this can happen in two hours. It's very easy. You have to um, make clear that this is teamwork so you can never be afraid of the spider by yourself otherwise you're a very bad therapist. You uh, you, you can't be afraid of spiders and tell another person don't be afraid of spiders. He don't believe you. Um, so um, therefore you, I'm afraid of snakes a little bit, but no more. I, it's gone. I trained with a little snake uh, for hours and it's gone. It's, I, I can do it without, you wouldn't see it that I'm afraid. Um, so, um, we know that psychotherapy of anxiety disorders is effective, but what are the mechanisms? Um, and I will show you one mechanism we know for a long period of time. This is from a patient who is afraid of being entrapped. A claustrophobic, would we say. We put this patient in a little cabinet here. There it is. It's at our institute. Jarek knows it. And then we close the door and lock it. So um, this patient cannot get out. And the patient thinks, oh, I don't know whether I will, su will that survive. Um, but what will happen? Um, this is his heart rate. Um, at the time when he is sitting in front of the cabinet and thinks about the situation to come. We let him do this for 10 minutes. And he, he sits there with a pulse rate of about 85 beats per minute. That's quite high just sitting. But then it goes down and then we sit him into the chair, into the chamber and the heart rate goes up again and then goes down. And you see if we look at the first four minutes we get this sort of habituation within four minutes and that's what we really see during almost every exposure session. After a short period of time the physiological activation goes down. Not the ratings but the physiological activation. So we are on a safe side. And what I also tell every patient uh, is wh what do you think, how high can a pulse rate be if you are anxious? Give me an estimate. What do you think? What is the highest ever measured pulse rate in an anxiety state? No idea? It's 232 beats per minute. You will never manage that in an exposure session to reach. Never, ever. This was a, uh, was a test that was done by a colleague of mine who was, um, for his first time of his life, was jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. And when he had a pulse uh, monitor at his wrist and he measured the pulse rate when he got out of the plane of 200 and 32 beats per minute. There was the highest rate, anxious uh, heart rate increase that was ever measured uh, in the literature. This is far below that. We are at 85. 
Okay. Um, perhaps I skip the panic because um, this would be perhaps too much. Um, but this is uh, interesting in so far because um, this fear comes out of the blue. We don't have any elicitor. Um, this is a case where we um, speak about a panic attack. And that always happens in certain situations in the supermarket um, or uh, if you are outside your house or um, in, in, a, in a cinema or so. And then you suddenly get this intense uh, feeling of fear um, with intense discomfort that reaches its peak within minutes. Uh, and, of course, in this case, you don't have a nice situation that you can construct because people don't know what they are afraid of. Because you can't run away from your own body. It's very difficult. If, if you think you, you suffocate, you, your heart is not working well, you can't run away because there's no other place with another heart. Um, you have to work with your body. Um, and. Um, this is um, what, what we see during a panic attack. Uh, these are um, physiological changes during a panic attack. And what you see is this, these are 26 panic attacks we measured. And we get an increase in heart rate. And if you have an increase in heart rate of about 5 beats per minute, people seem to recognize it. And then they press the panic button. So they respond to the increase in the physiological arousal. And that's, the, um, in, in principle, the, the problem that people have. So they start to avoid arousing events. They are afraid to bring their heart rate up. They're afraid um, of um, any exercise and so forth. And of course, that has uh, certain effects on the cardiovascular system as well. We found out that those people, for example, lay flat for two hours longer than normal people uh, on average during the day, which in changes the entire cardiovascular system. Um, and another problem we see um, is that these panic attacks often go along with avoidance to those situations in which the panic attacks occur. And this is fatal because um, this um, leads to the effect that people start to develop a, a large bunch of situations. And we call that agoraphobia. Because if you think about the idea that something happens when you're outside of your home and 90% of the panic attacks happen outside of your home, you associate this fear with the context where it appears in. And these contexts can be very diverse. Uh, it can be public transportation. We find that they're often in public transportation when people ride buses or trains. Uh, it can be um, being in open spaces. Um, in parking lots or marketplaces or bridges. Uh, it can be uh, in enclosed spaces in the cinema or in the escalator or uh, in a theater. Um, and it can be um, in, happen in a crowd or it can be happening when you are outside of the home alone, when you are just walking in the woods and then suddenly you get this panic attack out of the blue. And this is, of course, when you associate that um, with the panic attack, then you are really getting more and more immobile, and that's uh, very impairing. Okay, um, how can you treat that? How can you treat this sort of fear? And I would like to show you some data of a multicenter study, uh, which is a clinical study uh, where you look at therapy responses um, in patients. This is a study that was. Uh, sponsored by the German government, um, and uh, it was run with uh, 369 patients. And I show you the uh, therapy conditions, uh, and you can also see the uh, therapy there. Uh, the first three sessions, all patients got, they, we um, told them what anxiety is, what fear is, what avoidance is, how this all uh, sits together, and we did a so-called individual problem analysis. We wanted to know how this uh, disorder developed. Uh, then we had two sessions where we um, confronted them with physiological signals like dizziness, like palpitations, like uh, sweating, um, 
rousing symptoms. Uh, they had to run on the place and so forth. They had to climb stairs and these kinds of things. And then we had this so-called exposure sessions. And in this exposure sessions, we had two conditions. In one condition, the therapist went with them outside into the situation. And in the other condition, uh, they were just instructed to do it by themselves. Uh, the therapists just didn't do anything. They just encouraged the patient to do it like Goethe. Just do it by yourself and see what happens. And then we had uh, another session where we talked about anticipatory anxiety and potential threats and how this all develops. And then we had again two sessions uh, where they either were trained with a the therapist and uh, or they were uh, treated alone. And here is uh, th the group with the therapist was called T plus and the group without therapist was called T minus. And I'll show you the uh, most important results. Uh, if you run this clinical trials, you have to define the so-called primary outcome measures. Um, you are not allowed to, to do that, to look at the end, what worked best. You have to write down in your uh, application where you expect your effects and then you have to give it to an ethical board and then they write it down and then at the end you just look at your primary outcome. You are not allowed to look at anything else. So we have four primary outcome measures uh, that we measured um, and we did a so-called, and this is another um, tricky word, the so-called um, last observation carried forward analysis. Um, this, this is when you do a clinical treatment and you start with, let's say, 370 patients, not all patients come to the final session. Some people drop out. Um, and of course, um, in principle, if you only look at those patients who finish the treatment, you always overestimate your treatment effect. Uh, therefore, you need to also to analyze all the patients who, do, do, who dropped out, who did not uh, reach the end of the treatment. So that is uh, meant by last observation carried forward. But the main message is here. This is a so-called Hamilton anxiety scale. This is clinical judgment and you see a strong reduction in the treatment groups compared to the waitlist group. This is self-report, panic attacks, number of panic attacks, intensity of panic attacks, strong drop in the treatment groups compared to the control group. This is a so-called mobility inventory. How mobile were people? How strong was the avoidance after treatment? It is bigger. Mobi immobility reduced. And this is clinical, general clinical uh, impression. This is sort of a general clinical score. Same effect. But the other main message is it's not very important that the therapist is accompanying the patient. The patient can do it by himself. So what the therapist has to do, the therapist has to motivate the patient to do these exercises by themselves. Okay. Um, yeah, these, these are the uh, basic conclusions I wanted um, uh, to show you to get them home. So systematic exposure to the feared situations, um, that means the surrender passive avoidance is a key component in treating anxiety disorders. During each uh, exposure, during such exposure therapy, fear reduction occurs during and between sessions very quickly. For transfer to non-trained situations, it is important to activate other mechanisms of change, um, notably extinction learning. I couldn't go into detail with that. That would have been too much. Um, in therapy, it is therefore important to increase the prediction error by increasing the discrepancy between the central concerns people have and the experience made in the situation. So whenever you go into an exposure situation, you have always asked the patient first, what does he expect? What is the reason for his anxiety? What, what potential threat does he expect? And if he expect to faint, let him test that. Go into the situation and see, okay, how big is the probability that you will faint? And if he says 80%, you ask, okay, 80% is a chance that you will faint when we go into this bus. Yes. Will you go into this bus? Yes. Then let's do it. And then after the bus ride, the patient will not faint, I can promise you. 
at least most patients will not faint. And even if they faint, it's not very important. Um, they wake up again. And, um, but most of the patients do not faint. And then after the therapy, you ask, OK, if we do it again, what do you think? How big would the probability be that you faint if we do this bus ride again? You would say, hmm, 40%. Say 40%, OK, let's test it. So you go back with the bus. And then after the ride, you say, OK, if we take the bus ride again, how will be the probability that you fade now? And I can tell you, you need about 11 trials until he finally says zero. And then you say, OK, now let's take, let's say, an escalator. How probable will it be that you faint there, 80%? So you start all over again. It takes a long time until the patients change their expectancies, until the prediction error really is big enough to change your mind. That's not that easy. And you have to do it again and again and again. And the more the patient practices, the better it is. I wanted to show you some data of it, but it would be too much, so I just skip that. Um, in addition, uh, what we also see in these exposure therapies, we also see a big effective response we call relief. And we currently uh, explore that because that's, that's a very, very strong emotion. Uh, because if you expect something bad to happen and it doesn't happen, it's not only a cognitive thing. You also have a big effective response. We do not know much about it. Uh, what happens in the brain when something bad you badly something you something badly you expect does not happen? What happens to the brain? We think that this is as good as a drug because it probably activates the reward system of the brain. We do not know that yet, but uh, we believe that this is this the same sort of effect we have. Uh, we don't need drugs to do that at all. We can just do it by learning. Um, and we think that both mechanisms are probably important for generalizing these exposure effects. You can't just do one practice and then um, let the patient go home. This uh, will definitely lead to the return of fear. You need more time, you need more practice, you need um, the motivation of the patient. Of course, everything I showed you is just the work of a big group. Um, I'm here because I'm the oldest. And these are all the um, people who did the work, who went into the laboratory, um, worked with the patients, um, did all these uh, trials. Now I want to show you one important character here. Uh, this is um, some of the central research group members a couple of years ago. You might not recognize him. Uh, here he is. Uh, there's Jarek. The group was smaller than at that time, um, but it was as productive. Thank you very much for listening for such a long period of time. And uh, we are now open for discussion. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I have two questions actually. The first one is regarding the um, getting into the feared situations part. Uh, is the um, no escaping part really that important? Like, um, is, is, is it possible to have a treatment with like, um, is it possible to escape the situation when you get into the fear situation mm -hmm. and something bad happens, mm -hmm. is it okay to escape the that place? What do you mean by bad? Like, I don't know. Something that you expected to happen happens. Situation. Of course, if they if they then does want it, to invest more it? time to train, because every escape increases the trials uh, to learn that nothing bad happens. Because, because you always increase the probability estimates that bad things happen. And that's, that's the main problem you always face. If, if each escape behavior makes fear worse, always. And you have to make that clear. And you also have to make clear that this is hard work. You, you also, you do, don't need a pill because you need to feel the anxiety fade away. 
Uh, okay, so the second question is about the multi-center study. Is it available online? Yeah, there, there are many um, publications on it. The, the biggest one, or the, the first one, is in Journal of Clinical and Consulting Psychology, 2011. Glosser is the first author. Okay. And, this, and then you can follow it up. Um, there are several other publications. One important is, uh, for example, that depression goes away. Um, even if we do not treat depression, 50% of the uh, anxiety disorder patients were depressed, severely depressed. And uh, we didn't treat de depression, we just treated anxiety, but the depression went away too. Uh, because people got more mobile, and this is important too. Without any medication, they didn't take, they didn't take any anti antidepressants. We all washed them out. We didn't need it. Uh, they didn't need any antidepressant. That's important. You uh, try to convince us that exposure on fear is good for us, yeah, to uh, to to treatment to be better. And I've got a question: Are there any researchers that this exposure can uh, cause some mental diseases or can even uh, wake up our monsters or things like those? That it work, works opposite way that we try to cure ourselves, but we can uh, put ourselves into deep hole. Um, this is often uh, said, of course, uh, but uh, we do not have any serious data on that. We do not have any bad side effects. Um, we would have to report those in those clinical trials, and there are many, many trials. The only adverse effects we see is dropout. And we see about 15%, 16% of the patients who do not want to do this. And of course, everybody is free to do that. Everybody can say, no, I, this is not my therapy. And um, then the, we, we will never force a patient into that who is not motivated to do that. That's very important. Uh, you, you can't force somebody to do this. Um, and um, people who do not want to do it, uh, they shouldn't do it. And uh, this is the answer. I mean, um, you, can't, you, you can't make things worse by that because the fear fades away. That's a law. That's, that's a clear law, which you can observe in every situation. I can show you data from the bus. Uh, you see the drop in the heart rate. This was a lady, for example, heart rate 160, it dropped down to 80 after the one hour she was normal. This is what happens. Could you tell us a little more about the different methods when we see somebody in panic attack, in real panic attack, tell us about to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to take like a child very close and, and, and maybe there, there are some other methods very simple yeah. to use. The best method um, to get somebody out of panic if he still or she is still able to listen is to do a breathing training. Mm -hmm. uh, what we always do, we try to get the hyperventilation down uh, because panic is very often um, accompanied by strong hyperventilation. <laughs> so they, they breathe over the chest. So what we do is we tell them, put your hand on the stomach and try to move your hand in a way. And that is very difficult within the panic uh, but we get them away from the hyperventilation. Mm -hmm. So we try to get them a deep breath over the stomach. And uh, then we sometimes are able that they breathe themselves out of the panic attack. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, the second question, uh, because I met somebody after the trauma episode. Hmm. Uh, trauma is a different story. The, yeah, okay. And, and at, after started the panic attacks in the the same situation, yeah, like a car and something like this. And uh, yeah, it was very, very difficult for, for, for this person to, to, how to even, you know, how to, what to do, yeah, in that, that moment when, when he, he started that, that this panic attack is closer and closer and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to go a step more distal. Whenever it, it becomes too serious, 
you need to go more distal. Was this a traffic accident? Or? Uh, yeah, it, it was a, um, a heart attack, almost heart attack in, in, uh, during the, the normal um, car uh, road. Almost know, so. heart attack. I'm uh, not yeah, sure. It, yeah, it wasn't, but because somebody... Uh, uh, so it was yeah. a panic attack in the car? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See, that's uh, it's not a heart attack. A heart attack would be an ischemia. We, we he, he, ho he, he told, uh, thought that it, it, it is a, a heart attack, so uh, he went to the hospital and uh, after one the day okay. they told me that it wasn't a heart attack. The heart, yeah. This yeah. is always important to tell the patient. Yeah. The heart is okay. Yeah. It's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the no, panic but attack is here. No, it's important. What, what they're doing. You have to and really, you have to dispute with the patient. What is a heart attack? Mm -hmm. What causes a heart attack? It's because you have an ischemia at the heart. Do you have an ischemia at the heart? No, the physician tell, told me, no, I have it. It's just a feeling. Okay, where does the feeling come from? It might come from a thousand things. Um, and now let's find out where do the feelings come from. Let's first try, is it the entrapment? Or is it the way that I lose control? Or what is it? You have to work with the thoughts. Um, and you have to make clear that it's not an ischemia. This is... This is the cat catastrophic concern people have. I, I will die from an ischemia. The physician tells me, no, I don't have an ischemia. Do you believe the physician? Have you seen the pictures from your heart? What, 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 what is, a, is a ischemia? What, what is, a, is a stroke? And we often talk to patients about these things to, um, to question the central concerns. That's very important. You can't just go into the situation and then drive or die. This, this is not the way you do it. Uh, this is important. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I would like to start with, uh, you mentioned that there are no people with uh, suffering from um, guinea pig phobia. So I'm one of them. Uh -huh. um, I generally hate rodents. Uh, so guinea pigs, hamsters, um, rats, mice, I really hate them, but that's not actually the, my question. My question is, you briefly touched upon uh, generalized anxiety disorder. I understand that wasn't the topic of the presentation itself, uh, but what course of treatment would you suggest to patients who are feeling general anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, but they don't know what's the trigger? Okay, uh, generalized anxiety is what uh, the word clearly also makes clear is that it's a generalized worry. So the main cause of the anxiety is a generalized worrying. Uh, so you have to work with the worrying. Um, and the main thing what warriors do is they anticipate the future without doing a risk assessment. Um, and the reason why they don't do it is they stop at a certain point because they say, no, this is too ugly for me. So what we do is we just do the risk assessment to the very end. So if you worry about your financial situation, how will that be in 10 years? Will you sleeping below the bridge? Or um, where will you be in 10 years? Where will you be in five years? Where will you be next year? We go through the worries and do a very clear risk assessment. And then the patients sometimes say, no, mostly they say, I don't know what is in 10 years. Um, I don't know what is in five years. And if you track them down to a week, uh, then you can really test the worries. And uh, that is how uh, that is done, because the worries are often very abstract. They, they are circles within the brain. It's, it's like the ruminations. The ruminations go into the past, and the worry goes into the future. But it's basically that you unplug the brain from the environment. And uh, that makes these things so dangerous because people are just working within their own uh, vicious circles in the brain and they have no more contact to the environment. Uh, this is the main problem you have by depression, by the way. They, they are just within their own brain. They don't take part in the environment anymore. And worries are some some the same, uh, just uh, future-oriented. It's often comorbid. It's often comorbid, comorbid disorder. Um, as far as your guinea pig thing is concerned, it's a touch. It's a touch of the paws. 
Um, and I would work with a touch of the paws when I would work with you. I'm pretty sure. You would be able to find a guinea pig cute within an hour, I promise. Well, I would say it's more about the teeth and the tail. Guinea pigs do not have any tail. But they're just disgusting. <laughs> let's, let's take a look. I know they are disgusting. <laughs> But we need to know what is disgusting at the guinea pig. You need to be a little bit more precise. Teeth is interesting. I find teeth interesting. Okay. So how does social anxiety treatment look like? Is it like working in groups or you have like another people on the therapy? Uh, you mean exposure uh, in specific phobia or? Uh, uh, social phobia. Social phobia. Uh, social anxiety. Social, I didn't touch that today because that's complicated. Um, because you have many different social anxieties. I will, I will tell you one story. We, have, we had one lady who always had the problem to vomit in public. And uh, so she had many avoidance behavior. She didn't wear um, very narrow uh, skirts anymore. And uh, she didn't take big meals and in, in the public. So, so she... Uh, organized her entire life for avoiding vomiting in, in the public. And we wanted to know what's the central concern. And the central concern was if I experience some nausea, I will vomit. So the first point was to induce nausea and see whether it immediately f leads to vomiting. So we took YouTube videos. Uh, from people who drank a lot of alcohol and then vomiting. And you can find them in the net, they are very disgusting. If you see them, you immediately get nause nausea. And this lady got nausea too, but she didn't vomit. And I said, well, you, you didn't vomit, Weren't you uh, did, didn't you fe feel nausea? She said, well, it was terrible. I said, how terrible? 100. And uh, what was the probability that you vomit? 100%. Did you vomit? No. We repeated this 21 times. And then she finally recognized, oh, I can experience nausea without vomiting. And then she, tr she reduced her avoidance behavior in public. And that was the key how to, to get to the central concern to get her back into public. We didn't let her vomit in the public or gave her... Um, uh, so, some medication that she would vomit in the public. That was not our uh, approach. That we wanted to tackle the central concern. And if you have socially anxious people, you have to know what is the central concern. Is it that they ha fear that other people will embarrass them? And then you ask them, what do you mean by that embarrass? Uh, they might see some water on my clothes and they might think that I'm incontinent. And then you test that. You see how many people see wet spots on your clothes. And how many people think that you are incontinent. And these are the sort of um, interventions we do in social phobics. Um, and of course, some people also need some um, new uh, skills too. And we also train skills how to be nice to other people, how to be nasty to other people, and what happens if you are nasty to other people, and those kinds of things. Also, to see what you want to do in a special situation. Do you want to orient on the goal? Do you want to orient on your own motivation? Do you want to motivate on the motivation of the other? That's important, because if you want to be nice, you have to pay attention what the other people want. If you want to get your right, you have to concentrate on your own motivation because you have to say what you want. And these are all things uh, we um, train those people because they, they are heavily confused. They uh, stay with people, they treat them badly because they are afraid to be um, that, that the, the partner goes away. So um, we ask them, why are you doing things that are not good for you? And um, why don't you look at your own motivational system and these kinds of things? That's important in social phobia. 
Anxiety people always try to avoid things. They never know what they want. So you always has to you always have to find out what they want. Because if you center your entire life around avoidance, you do not know what you want. I was wondering whether there's some research about anxiety caused by hormonal problems. Because I heard that, for example, in diabetes, the second type, uh, people usually feel anxiety and depression, what can be taken as psychological problems. Is there a way to recognize it or distinguish that anxiety might be caused by physical problems alone? Well, this, this is a tricky question. I mean, we have really looked for decades uh, for looking for a biomarker of anxiety or depression, and we weren't very successful. We haven't found a single biomarker yet. Insulin was one of the candidates. Um, and we have looked in almost every organ. And uh, lately, we even look at the biomasses. We, we go into the colon and look how people digest and uh, how they, um, what they do with their food. And even there, we do not find a single biomarker. It will be a, probably a combination um, of uh, a specific genetic disposition and learning experience in the environment and also how you deal with these kinds of distress and discomfort you feel when you have changes in the in the body due to diabetes for example because this changes your body and uh, but this does not only change your body it also changes how you evaluate your bodily responses and that makes you more anxious um, you know about the potential threat and all these things are as important as well so it's very easy to mistake uh, causes of your anxiety, right? Yeah, because Thank it's you. so helpful. Anxiety helps you to survive. It, and therefore, it's so difficult to treat. Uh, and we only treat it when it really gets into the way of your life. And that's the important thing. You can't, you can't abolish anxiety. Then you are dead. You have to live with it. That's the important thing. And you have to live good with it because you can't destroy a biological, senseful system. And you never tell a patient you will never have anxiety again because that doesn't happen. I would like to change the subject a little bit because you mentioned during your lecture that we should let our children uh, challenge their childhood fears. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, do, I, do I understand cor like correctly? If we let the kids to escape from the dream, from the fears. That means that we use reinforcements uh, in, uh, in the instrumental con conditioning. Say it again, I, I didn't get the point. Uh, we, if we let our kids uh, escape from the fears, from the childhood fears, okay. like darkness, mm -hmm. heights, then we simply reinforce the fears. In, that's true. That's true. So, so uh, should we use the same method, I mean uh, instrumental conditioning, to, uh, to, to make the kids want to challenge the fears? Exactly. And you should do it with force. For example, let's stay with the example. Uh, kids fear darkness. And then you say, this is a stupid fear. We close the door. And now you stay within the darkness. This is terrible. So what you yes, have to is. do is to work with the fear. What is the problem with fear? So in this case, it's lack of control. And because the kid doesn't see anything and the kid wants to see what's going on. So you have to negotiate the distance of the threat. How much darkness can you stand? And you can easily Modu modulated by the opening of the door. You can uh, put on the light outside the, the, the sleeping room and then you slowly close the door as long as the kid says, no, this is enough. And then, then you say, okay, let's see. What do you think what will happen tonight if we do it this way? Uh, I might get nightmares. Tell me if you get nightmares. And uh, 
if you have a week without any nightmares, without any tantrums, without any anxiety, close the door a little bit more. And then you will see how relieved the child will be that it's so courageous uh, that it can now sleep in the dark. That's how it should be done. Never force it. Never. You need to take this fear serious. That's all I can say. I mean, Thank you. Otherwise, it's really, that's cruel. You should never do that. Okay. To było ostatnie pytanie. I dziękuję Państwu za obecność, za, za pytania, za. No, nie spodzieliśmy się aż tak ogromnego grona i bardzo się cieszymy. And thank you, Mr. Professor. Uh, we have a little gift for you from our university. And I would like to ask uh, Ms. Beata Wiotrowska from the City Hall of Poznań. Uh, she also has a gift for you. So thank you very much for your interesting uh, lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> this is all for me. A little gift.